It's time to beat Pokemon Yellow with only a Bellsprout, the Pokemon with the nicest Pokedex number that prefers hot and humid places. Makes sense. Unfortunately for Bellsprout, its front sprite is not particularly good in yellow, at least it is better than the version from red and blue. I nicknamed mine colon O because this is the only appropriate name for its evolutionary line. Against the rival in the lab, we get our first chance to see Bellsprout's back sprite. And this one is absolutely terrible. It looks like it's got lips and it's sort of like a hunched over old man. An old man with lips. I do not like this one bit. Eevee completely drops the ball in this fight and I take an easy victory. Bellsprout levels up to level 6, meaning that it's either a medium fast or medium slow growth rate Pokemon. In this case, it's medium slow, which means it's going to level up faster than the medium fast group until level 68. Now, let's look at Bellsprout's base stats. It has 50 HP, 75 attack, 35 defense, 70 special, and 40 speed, giving it a 7.81% chance to crit, or a 62.5% chance to crit with high crit rate moves. Base 75 attack and base 70 special are quite good for a first stage Pokemon. Another big advantage for it is its move pool. While it isn't large or diverse, it has access to Vine Whip, Growth, Wrap, Sleep Powder, Acid, Razor Leaf, Slam, Swords Dance, Double Edge, Mega Drain, Solar Beam, Mimic, Reflect, Rest, and Cut. Obviously, the standout move here is Growth. Being able to set up is going to be so useful in this playthrough, and the ability to boost special is so broken in Generation 1. Even with the ability to set up though, I won't be able to get to Brock on minimum battles because I can't knock out the final Caterpie in the forest fast enough. Because of that, I have to fight one additional trainer here, so I choose the second bug catcher who opens with a Metapod. It knows Harden. This allows me to set up six growths for free and take a quick and easy victory with Vine Whip. It was important for me to use six growths there to minimize the number of uses of Vine Whip, specifically because this move has a strangely small PP. Like, Bubble has 30 pp, and Ember has 25 pp, but apparently Vine Whip doesn't deserve that. By setting up growth, I can serve enough uses of Vine Whip to get to the mandatory bug catcher and still have enough to defeat his Caterpie. With two uses of growth, Vine Whip three shots, and now I'm moving on to Pewter City to fight Brock. The great thing about starting with a grass move is that Brock won't be an issue. Geodude goes down to a single vine whip. Oh nice, it was a critical hit, that's great. Onyx is next, Bellsprout doesn't outspeed, Brock chooses bind, but it misses, and then vine whip hits, and the rock hard snake falls. So Bellsprout gets one of the easiest Brock splits to date. Heading on to Route 3, I was a bit worried about the first bug catcher, because my only damage dealing move is Vine Whip. At least his first Caterpie can't do much to me, so I set up with growth completely before the Weedle comes out. Okay, looks like Vine Whip is going to be a 2 hit here, but then the small poisonous bug survives on a sliver just to spite me. After that, the following Caterpie is easy to knock out. Next is Short Sky. He's quite terrifying for Pokemon that don't have to overlevel for Brock. Remember the Poliwag video? Rattata's doing a lot of damage to Bellsprout, so I go for Vine Whip slightly early and knock it out. Next is Ekans, and luckily for Bellsprout, it moves first, so it can trap the snake with Wrap. The tables have turned, because Ekans is usually the one that defeats its foes with Wrap. Not today. What's becoming very apparent to me during this early portion of the route is that Bellsprout's moveset is quite slow. Either I have to set up using Growth to be able to use Vine Whip and one-hit the Poison or Bug Pokemon, or I have to use Wrap, which is quite possibly the most frustratingly slow move to use. At least it's great because if you outspeed, you can basically just win for free. I quite literally can't remember using Wrap as a kid just because it bothered my ADHD so much to watch the health bar deplete that slowly. I just needed like, I don't know, like Hydro Pump or something. Just knock them out in one hit, that's way better. At the end of this route, I figure out that I can combo Poison Powder and Wrap together to knock this Metapod out a little bit faster, and that prevents its annoying defense boosting tactics. I heal up and enter Mount Moon. In here, I grab the rare candy, and then I face the only hiker in the cave for some quick experience. After all, his rock ground types are all one hits with Vine Whip. Before the super nerd, I decide to heal because he does have two poison types, and I have to set up on Grimer if I want this fight to be decently fast. After getting my growths, I take the Grimer out with a combination of Vine Whip followed by Wrap. Next is Voltorb, and I knock it out with a single Vine Whip. And finally, it's Zace, coughing. I'm pretty beat up at this point. Hopefully the poison type won't do that much damage. My first Vine Whip takes it to orange. It retaliates with Tackle, doing 5 hit points of damage. And then I knock it out, taking the victory. 
At this point, I have to make what is the hardest choice of any playthrough. Um, what am I even saying? It isn't even a choice. I have to take the Dome Fossil. Like, why would you ever take the Helix Fossil? Now, it's time to face Jesse and James. Ekans is first. Against it, I set up growth six times because I need to be able to two-shot the coughing to avoid damage. A consequence of setting up here for this long is that Ekans is able to lower my defense three times with Leer. That's really not good. I only have nine defense left. I finish the snake off, Meowth comes out, outspeeds, and does so much damage with Scratch. Bellsprout survives with five hit points. Okay, really not feeling confident about this now. Fine Whip hits and it does massive damage taking the cat out in a single hit. Fate is on my side. I can use this against Coughing to prevent it from attacking. However, if I miss, that's not going to work, and Coughing takes Bellsprout out. So that's my first reset. The last time I saved was before the Super Nerd, so now I have to battle him all over again to earn the right to face Jesse and James. I start to set up against Ekans, but quickly realize that Bellsprout is outspeeding, which means I can just knock it out with Wrap and preserve my defense for Meowth. However, this time it uses Bite, which still does a lot of damage. Making matters worse, with only two growths, Vine Whip doesn't knock it out in a single hit. Because of that, Meowth gets one more scratch in, and it does so much damage. Oh great, it was a critical hit. Just lovely. So I have red health for the coughing again. I guess I have to gamble with the sleep powder. This time it hits, and I start to wrap against coughing. This is a problem though, because wrap is a multi-turn move, and it makes sleep wear off much faster. I decide to use Sleep Powder again, but in retrospect, I think it would have been slightly better to just keep using Wrap here, after all it has slightly higher accuracy. Either way, I end up knocking the coughing out, and now I'm moving on to Cerulean City. Normally, I have to make a decision here between facing the rival on Nugget Bridge or Misty, but with Growth and Vine Whip, I think it's a pretty obvious choice. Misty is clearly the right place to go now. However, in front of her is this Junior Trainer, with a Goldeen, and it has Peck. It could cause serious problems for me. Right away, I get confused by Supersonic. That's just great. What's the likelihood of that? That's like the move that hits the least out of any move in Generation 1. It's the dynamic punch in these games. I try for Sleep Powder, but Bellsprout hits itself in confusion. Goldeen doubles down on its Supersonic tactics and uses it again on the next turn, which is a very effective strategy when I'm already confused. This time, Bellsprout doesn't damage itself and it puts the fish to sleep. Now, let's set up growth but Bellsprout has other ideas and it hurts itself instead. Okay, so I have half health left. I do manage to get in two growths, but then the Goldeen wakes up. I'm not sure my damage range will be enough with Vine Whip, so I decide to Sleep Powder again. Goldeen moves first and uses Peck, which does so much damage to Bellsprout, but it just barely survives. My next Sleep Powder puts it to sleep, and then Vine Whip knocks it out in a single hit. All right, now I'm feeling pretty silly. Should probably have attacked right away. I got caught by sleep tactics again. Either way, I'm moving on to Misty. My strategy here is fairly simple. I'll put the Staryu to sleep, if uh, sleep powder ever hits that is. Oh good, it did on the second turn. And after that, I'll set up growth four times. This allows me to one-shot the Staryu, but more importantly, I'm going to be able to two-hit the Starmie. Misty's good AI forces her into using Tackle. Because Starmie hits so much harder than the Staryu, I want to ensure that I can take it out quickly once it hits the field. Okay, let's do this. Everything appears to be going according to plan, and so that's an easy victory for me. It's time to face the rival on Nugget Bridge. Spiro's first, it moves first and misses a Fury attack. That's just perfect. And then Sleep Powder misses. Okay, less perfect. Following the lack of perfection, it uses Peck, doing almost half. Sleep Powder misses again, and then Spiro uses Growl. Okay, that's fine, I guess. Finally, Sleep Powder connects, putting the bird to sleep, but as soon as that happens, I realize this isn't really a good solution for it. That's because it resists Vine Whip, and Wrap is going to let it wake up. Plus, my attack has already been lowered. I decide to set up Growth anyways. I think that's the best choice here. I'll be able to knock out the following Pokemon with ease after all. Okay, I just need to be able to take this thing out. But after waking up for the second time, it pecks right away and takes Bellsprout to four hit points. I wrap and trap it down to orange health, but then it knocks me out. All right, let's try that again. I'm not gonna use rare candies right now because they won't push me over the next damage rounding threshold. I would need to be level 23 for that. This time, conveniently, Spiro stays asleep and I get four growths set up. It continues to snooze and I knock it out with four hits from wrap. Santru's next, and all the growths that I've set up allow me to one-hit it with Vine Whip. Rattata could use Quick Attack, but it doesn't and goes down to a single Vine Whip as well. All that's left is his ace, Eevee. While it doesn't faint to a single hit, I don't have enough health left. 
Oh, uh, it actually just uses Tail Whip and misses instead, so I take it out on the next turn. Now, Nugget Bridge is next and it demands a lot of PP, but mine's quite small and inefficient. I made peace with the reality of this situation as I was defeating these trainers. Today, I'm going to have to go back and visit Nurse Joy before I get the elixir. The third lass's Pidgey uses Sand Attack, and that's a really awful start to the fight. I might not have the stamina to defeat it now. Okay, stop using Sand Attack, please. I run out of PP for Wrap, and that means that I have to use Vine Whip against the bird. Luckily, Sleep Powder doesn't miss, so it's not going to continue to use Sand Attack. But my Vine Whip misses, and I only have 5 PP left. There's still a Nidoran after this bird, and Vine Whip's not very effective against it either. I think the best thing to do here is set up with growth to maximize Vine Whip's damage. After all, I can't miss when boosting my stats. Vine Whip misses one more time before it finally knocks the Pidgey out. Now it's time for Nidoran. I set up one more growth. I only have three chances with Vine Whip. The first one hits, but it takes Nidoran to orange. Okay, I was hoping for a little bit more damage. Please just hit again. It does, and that's it. I head back to heal, restore my PP, and then I crush the rest of the trainers before Bill's house. Uh, oh wait, <laughs> never mind. I miss rap against the next lass's Pidgey, and this gets violently out of control again because of sand attack. But luckily, Bellsprout hits and takes the bird out. I can't wait for level 26 to learn acid. I really want a move other than a grass move. Also, acid is this only stab poison move, and it has 100% accuracy, so it's gonna be great. With Bellsprout, what I'm learning is that every fight feels slightly stressful. Granted, I am making it through the game on almost minimum battles. I fought a total of two additional trainers so far. However, this leads to the fact that Bellsprout's at a low level, and it feels like I have to save before every encounter. With Nugget Bridge out of the way, I head out of Cerulean City towards Vermilion City. Rocket Man leads with Machop, Sleep Powder hits, I set up Growth twice, and then Vine Whip doesn't KO. Come on, it survived on a sliver? Are you kidding me? Of course Rap misses on the next turn, just to annoy me, and then I KO. Next is Drowsy, and this Pokemon is specifically why I was afraid of this fight. However, Bellsprout's faster, so it should be able to trap with Rap. But of course, Rap misses, Drowsy uses Hypnosis, and why would the AI miss? So now I'm asleep. I just need to wake up, then I'm gonna have this fight. But Bellsprout is very sleepy. So sleepy that even a critical hit from Confusion doesn't wake it up. So that's reset number three. I attempt again immediately, and this time Rap works and I'm able to take the Drowsy out. In the tunnel, I pick up the full restore. This is a really important item because the gentleman on the SSN. I want that rare candy, and I also want a way to heal the burn status in case Ponyta inflicts it. Continuing the theme, I save in front of the Pidgey Jr. trainer. I put the first one to sleep and immediately realize that this isn't a good choice. After all, I'm faster. Yes, my vegetable is faster than these birds, so Rap's going to be the right choice here. It's for hitting each of her team members. As long as it continues to hit, I should be good. It does, and even though the last Pidgey takes 5 hits, I still manage to take the victory. I got a bit overconfident now because I immediately try to face the next junior trainer, but as soon as the Spearow comes out, I remember that it has Peck. I'm getting flashbacks now to the rival on Nugget Bridge. However, this one is much less effective and I knock it out. So, he wasn't an issue, no need to save. It's time for the SSN, and today I'm going to make a bold choice. I'm not going to the restroom. Also, Bellsprout can't learn Body Slam, so there's no use going in there either. I head straight for the gentleman's quarters, where of course I save before him because his fire types terrify me. Growlithe is first, it's not very good, so Rap takes it out. Here Bellsprout levels up to 26 and I get a chance to learn Acid. Pretty convenient right before the Ponyta because I can use it. I replace Rap and then I go up against the Fire Horse. It outspeeds Bellsprout and uses Ember. I survive with decent health and it doesn't burn. So far so good. Acid takes it to Orange, I survive the next Ember, and it also doesn't burn. So that's it. Okay, honestly, I was thinking that Bellsprout would be a bit faster by this point in the game. Vine Whip's small PP and Rap's lack of urgency has made the early portions of the game quite slow. Plus, most of the trainers felt a little bit difficult. But that all changes here. Bellsprout dominates the rival's team, with only Eevee surviving a single hit. I'm out of potions now, so I head to Vermilion Mart and buy 5 super potions. I do this sometimes when I need extra healing, or I think that the Pokemon's particularly weak. I have not had good experiences with poison types in the past, so I'm a little bit worried. Now it's time to face Surge. Oh, uh, unless my software fails to solve the trash can puzzle. I was doing some development when I was filming this video, and I think I just messed something up. I've learned the lesson not to make like 12 updates in one day. Okay, now it's time for Surge.
Bellsprout hits a sleep powder right away, and Surge's only Pokemon falls asleep. So far, so good. I was really hoping that Acid would lower its defense here, but it doesn't. At least Raichu stays asleep and goes down over 4 hits. Once again, a completely lackluster performance by the Electric Master. I don't think we should call him a master, like the Electric Guy, like he's just a guy. The Wrapping Lass is coming up next, and the filter on her team is that her Oddish can paralyze you and then Bellsprout can wrap you into Oblivion. So I just really want to one-hit the Oddish. In this case, Acid is neutral against Oddish, so it doesn't do enough damage. She selects Stun Spore, but it misses. That's so lucky for me. I take the following Bellsprout down in two turns. It uses Poison Powder, which obviously doesn't work because I'm part Poison type. After that, her second Oddish comes out, and this one could also use Stun Spore. I go for Sleep Powder because I think it's a little bit safer than going for a two-hit with Acid. However, when I finally do use it, it crits anyways and knocks the Oddish out. So, no issues for Bellsprout here. On this route, I also have to fight one more mandatory trainer, so while I fight him, I'll mention a fact about Generation 1. Poison-type moves are super effective against bug Pokémon, and bug-type moves are super effective against poison-type Pokémon. We can see this here as I use Acid against the Caterpie and Weedle. By the way, I'm pretty sure that Poison and Bug are the only two types that have been super effective against each other, and that was only the case in Generation 1. So Venonat's getting kind of annoying now, anyways. Uh, another interaction of this type pairing is that Bug moves deal 4 times damage to Pokémon with the Grass Poison type. So Bellsprout really doesn't want to get hit by any of the bug moves in the game. This is probably going to be a little bit relevant later on. In Rock Tunnel, I continue saving in front of each trainer, because the first Pokemaniac, of course, has a Slowpoke that knows Confusion. After Vine Whip fails to one-hit the Cubone, I decide to set up Growth to ensure that I can one-hit the Slowpoke. The next Slowpoke trainer isn't an issue, and I make it all the way to the end of the cave and face the self-destructing Hiker. Unfortunately, the lack of PP means I have to use an Aether right before him, but that's okay, I picked this up anyways so I can use it in situations like this. Using Acid against the Rock-type Pokémon is not my idea of fun after all. Vine Whip, on the other hand, is a lot of fun, because it one-hits each one of his team members. So, Bellsport's made it to the mid-game, and it arrives in Lavender Town just under 26 minutes. This is not peak performance for a Pokémon, like Hypno would have been here much faster, but for a first stage Pokemon, this is quite good. I think the main thing slowing Bellsprout down is that it has to set up for each battle with Growth or Sleep Powder. Also, it needs to set up for the fight by saving, as is the case in front of this Gambler. Sleep Powder works first turn against the Growlithe, that's lucky for me, and then Acid 2 shots it. Vulpix is next. I decide to just attack and tank one Ember, and luckily a critical hit finishes Vulpix off in a single turn. So yeah, this gambler should uh, probably switch trainer classes now. Because this is a first attempt and I'm using a first stage Pokemon, I think grabbing the extra rare candy from the Rocket Hideout is a good idea. Plus, selling the additional items that I can collect here gives me more money to buy vitamins. I get a total of 4 Carbos, giving Bellsprout a decent boost to its speed. After that, I have to catch myself a Doduo, which is frustrating because these things know peck. I've had comments before where people say I should pause the timer while catching this Doduo, however each Pokemon interacts with the need to have a flying mule in a different way. For instance, fighting and grass types struggle more to catch a flyer because they take super effective damage from Peck. In this case, Sleep Powder allows me to catch a Doduo more easily than I would have if this Pokemon didn't have access to a sleep move. So I think this is actually a way that Pokemon differentiate themselves. I head back to Lavender Town and face the rival in Pokemon Tower. He leads with Firo. In this case, its only flying type move is Mirror Move, which is not particularly intimidating. I want to set up with Sleep Powder and then Growth. After I knock it out, his entire team should be an easy sweep. Magnemite, Shelder, Sandshrew, and Eevee are all one hits. Oh, unless I get a critical hit against the Eevee and that lets it survive. Generation 1 crits ignore all stat modifications, even beneficial ones, so in this case my boosted special was negated. Remember this because it's going to be very relevant soon. Now I have the unsavory task of knocking out some Ghastly. The problem is, I only have Grass and Poison type moves. Ghastly has a single resistance to Vine Whip and a double resistance to Acid. Since I have to boost my special with Growth, I think that using Vine Whip here is the best choice. The issue is, in order to set up, sleep has to work well, and I mean very well, because when Ghastly gets a hit in, it could really mess things up. After all, it can confuse, paralyze, or deal decent damage with Nightshade. After 4 turns of setting up, Vine Whip does half, Ghastly continues sleeping, and I try Acid just because it has weaker physical defense. But this clearly is not the right choice. 
the second Ghastly gets put to sleep, but Vine Whip crits, and only does a third as a result. Just great. However, I'm able to take it out over the next two turns and proceed. Usually this is the hardest Chandler in the tower, but today that's not the case. After setting up growth three times, Sleep Powder misses, and Ghastly's Lick paralyzes. Ugh, okay, come on Bellsprout, you really just need to keep attacking. This Ghastly is a higher level than the last two, so I want to set up more growths if I can. That gives Ghastly time to attack, however, my setup is still enough and I knock it out. Alright, that was a bit scary. But the next Chandler paralyzes me right away with Lick. Again. Are you kidding me? This just doesn't seem fair. Well, I made it past the last one, so I might be able to do this as well. But in this case, Ghastly wakes up, I decide to keep attacking, and this was the wrong choice. It takes me out, and that's my fourth reset. In the next fight, I don't get paralyzed, and so I'm able to take it out with ease. Moving on past that frustrating loss, now it's time for Team Rocket, and Bellsprout is really not set up to defeat them. Once again, I'm going to have to use Vine Whip or Acid to defeat Poison-type Pokemon. First is Meowth, and luckily it's a normal type, so that gives me the chance to set up growth and prepare for Arbok and Weezing. Because Meowth outspeeds, it manages to damage me a little bit, as well as lower my defense two stages before it faints. Arbok moves first with Leer, lowering my defense again, and Sleep Powder misses. Ugh, just great. And then it goes for Glare, paralyzing Bellsprout. It takes me down to 22 hit points, and then I finally put it to sleep. Okay, okay, I can do this. But, at the critical moment, I get a critical hit, so my stat modifications don't matter and Arbok survives, allowing it to knock Bellsprout out with Bite. This time I don't lose as much defense, so I don't take as much damage. I do have to knock the wheezing out with acid, which is kind of inconvenient, but it does end up as a win. At this point, Bellsprout has enough experience to learn Razor Leaf, and ordinarily this would be an incredibly useful move, because it has a boosted crit rate. However, Bellsprout's base speed only gives it a 62.5% chance to crit with Razor Leaf, and we have to remember that these crits bypass stat changes, so I won't be able to set up with growth. That really ruins the consistency of this move, and I don't think I'm going to use it very much today as a result. However, I still teach it to Bellsprout just for now because it is going to help against one trainer. With the tower out of the way, I head through Cycling Road to the Safari Zone. Here I grab the Carbos, Protein, and the key items required to progress with the playthrough. Next is Sylph. I head to the 10th floor right away and defeat the rocket with a single Machoke. Ouch, uh, that Karate Chop actually did a lot of damage. After that, I pick up the Calcium, defeat the Rocket with the Arbok in a really messy fight, and then I obtain the Card Key. The reason I came here before doing something else is that I want to go to the 7th floor and grab the TM for Swords Dance. This powerful setup move is going to be very useful in the next fight, which is against Erika. The strategy here is simple. I want to put Tangela to sleep and set up with Swords Dance. Of course, I miss, and Tangela wastes my time with Bind. On the second turn, I put it to sleep, and that gives me the time I need to set up three sword stances. With them, Acid is able to one-shot all of her team members. Now that Erica's out of the way, the next stop is going to be Koga's Gym. As I planned this route, I was pretty afraid of this place. Despite it being a poison gym, there are a lot of powerful psychic types in here, and Koga has a bunch of bugs. Bugs that know psychic moves. Luckily, Growth and Sword Stance, in combination with Sleep Powder, give Bellsprout the safety it needs to get past these challenging opponents. Now, I'll draw your attention to the dialogue that the second mandatory juggler in Koga's gym has. Alright, with that out of the way, let's face Koga himself. In this fight, I need Acid to be able to do enough damage to one-hit the Venonats. That way, they won't be able to hit me with super effective Psychic-type moves. I thought that putting the first one to sleep and setting up with Swords Dance would allow me to one-shot the other ones, but that doesn't appear to be the case. I get hit by Psybeam in the process. In case I get unlucky again, I decide to set up some growths to make Bellsprout more durable against these Psychic attacks. I knock the third one out and move on to Koga's ace, Venomoth. Here I need to pray because this thing is a rock fire type and it outspeeds me. Sleep Powder, please come through. It does, and I get an annoying critical hit. But the following acid is enough anyways. Alright, I uh, can't believe that I made it past Koga on my first attempt. However, things aren't going to get easier from here, because I plan to face Blaine next. But first, I've got a few things to do. In the Warden's house, I accidentally teach Squirtle Strength first, which is just a mistake. I always want to teach Surf first so that it goes in the bottom move slot. That way in Victory Road, I'm going to be able to select Strength from the first slot very quickly. It's uh, just much faster this way. 
By the way, there are less locations you need to surf than times you need to use strength. By the way, this uh, mistake was so very clearly frustrating that in Pokemon Mansion, I uh, decide to reset so that I can go back and fix it. Um, uh, yeah, oh, I guess I uh, have to beat Koga again now. But this is also part of my master plan, because I wanted to test a different strategy against him. This way we can answer the question of what happens if I set up fully with growth against the first Venonat. The order in which you set up badge boosts really matters, because the badge boosts from growth after Swords Dance are compounded on top of Swords Dance's boosts. If I use them the other way around, Swords Dance would negate the badge boost on the attack stat. Now, by setting up this way, Acid now one-shots all of the Venonats, Venomoth comes out, this powerful Fire Flying type is Bellsprout's worst nightmare, well, uh, only when Acid doesn't one-hit. But in this case, with my setup, it does. Because I've tested everything that I wanted to test, and I've also uh, fixed my mistake with Squirtle, now I can proceed through the mansion and continue with the run. These pesky rats like really need to stop showing up though, so I use 5 rare candies to make it less likely. On the bottom floor of the mansion, I pick up an item that I very rarely grab, TM22, otherwise known as Solar Beam. I don't think that I've ever used this move in one of my challenges, so stay tuned for some Solar Beam goodness in this run! But not yet, because now it's time for Blaine. It might seem risky to face these fire types now, but I think that Bellsprout can pull through. Sleep Powder allows me to put the Ninetales to sleep, and Growth has the potential to minimize damage from the fire type attacks. Unfortunately, I get hit by a flamethrower early on in the fight, and that takes Bellsprout to low health. I need 5 badge boosts here to ensure that I move first, so I could have set up one less Growth. After all, it won't help me survive a fire type move with this amount of health. But I just sort of autopiloted and kept the plan of 3 Swords Dances and 2 Growths. Now let's talk about my moveset. I brought Slam into this fight specifically instead of Takedown or Double Edge because it doesn't have any recoil damage. By the way, just because of the maximum amount of health that the Ninetales, Rapidash, and Arcanine has, Bellsprout would KO itself anyways from the recoil. So I really don't want to use that move. So please Slam, come through for me. It takes down the Rapidash, and all that's left is Blaine's Ace, Arcanine. I go for Sleep Powder, it works, and I take the Fiery Doggo out over two turns with Slam. Bellsprout did it on its first attempt. Now it's time to backtrack to Sylph to fight the rival. I completed Koga and Blaine ahead of the two major fights in Saffron City, that's so that I have the badge boost for speed and special here. Before fighting the rival, I save and teach Bellsprout Mega Drain in the place of Swords Dance. I don't think that I'm going to need to set up my attack anymore in this run. I move first against Sandslash, put it to sleep, and set up with Growth. From there, Mega Drain can hopefully one-hit all of his Pokémon. But I also have to make it through the Kadabra. It comes out, and I pray that Slam is going to hit. Unfortunately, it misses, Confusion hits, but Growth negates the majority of the damage. Bellsprout levels up, resetting its badge boost, but it's still faster than Flareon, and I hit with Slam. However, without badge boosts, it only does half. Flareon misses its attack, and so I just get to take it out the next turn. Okay, so it sort of feels like Bellsprout's starting to build some momentum now. And by the way, I think it's worth noting that the staples of Body Slam Rest and Mimic are actually not going to make an appearance in today's playthrough. After skipping Copycat's house, I head over to the gym to face Sabrina. Abra's first. It outspeeds and uses Flash, lowering Bellsprout's accuracy. Please, Sleep Powder, just work. But it doesn't, and Abra gets set up with Flash again. So this is getting bad. Internally, I debated just letting Flash stack up all the way while I set up Growth all the way, and then hoping that Slam would eventually just hit her Pokemon, but Sleep Powder works the third time I use it, and so I can set up now without my accuracy being lowered again. But the question is, can a very inaccurate move hit three times, even when my accuracy has been lowered? It does against Abra, knocking it out. Next is Kadabra, and once again, Slam hits. All right, so far so good. Now just one more to go. Can I do it? And in an absolute miracle, Slam connects again, and Alakazam falls to a single hit. So I'm almost finished all of the gym leaders, but Giovanni still remains. He leads with Doug Trio. Bellsprout doesn't outspeed, allowing the mole to go underground and use Dig, which does massive amounts of damage to my poison type. Sleep Powder misses, and Earthquake gets the KO. Okay, so that's a quick loss for me. What I have to rely on here is Sleep Powder followed by Growth. 
After four badge boosts, I'll be speed tied with Dugtrio. Five times allows me to outspeed all of his Pokemon. In the next fight, I manage to get fully set up and move on to the Persian. Unfortunately, a single Mega Drain doesn't take it out, but it doesn't do much damage in retaliation and goes down anyways. Nidoqueen time. I wasn't sure how much Mega Drain would do, and the answer is not enough. However, then I had a realization. This Nidoqueen and the following Nidoking are only going to spam Tail Whip or Leer. Yes, they do in fact know these moves. This is because Giovanni's good AI rejects Thunder and Double Kick because they're not very effective against Bellsprout. And the good AI erroneously checks the type combinations and determines that ground moves are not very effective against grass types, so it prevents him from using Earthquake, even though it would hit for neutral damage and be the best choice. After they both go down, his ace ride on his last, and obviously, Mega Drain takes it out in a single hit. So, I've earned myself the final badge. There's only one required trainer left before the league, the rival. My plan here is to set up against the Sandslash and then sweep his team. Sleep Powder works first turn, but Sandslash wakes up and uses Poison Sting, and then I had a realization. That's the only move that it's going to be able to use because of good AI. I can save a bit of time here by just spamming growth while Sandslash Poison Stings away. After all, my typing prevents it from inflicting the status. Next is Execute, and I want to make sure that I avoid getting paralyzed here, so I put it to sleep and knock it out with Slam. A fully set up Mega Drain 1 hits the Cloister, leading to Magneton. And here, once again, the good AI disallows it from using electric type attacks. That means I can't get paralyzed, and that's really good because that's the thing I fear most against this thing. Cadaverous next. Because I leveled up going into the Magneton, I'm now being outsped. It sets up Reflect, and my Slam misses. Okay, not a very good first turn. Next, it moves first, and this time it crits with Psybeam, and... gets the KO. Alright, so that's pretty annoying. My next attempt, I manage to finish it off and move on to the Flareon. Because Slam wasn't doing very much against the Kadabra, I put the fire type to sleep and then knock it out over four turns. I did miss once. So Bellsprout has made it all the way to the league. While it is achieving a fantastic time so far for a first stage Pokemon, the synergy between its useful moves do slow it down. Vine Whip has low PP, Growth takes forever to set up, Wrap is just slow, and Sleep Powder is also slow and inconsistent. Mega Drain does take more frames to animate because it also has to heal, and Solar Beam is a two-turn move. Yes, you heard that right. Now it's time to use Solar Beam against the League. Up first is Lorelei. Lorelei leads with Dugong, and it seems like this thing is going to choose between either Rest or Aurora Beam because of type effectiveness. However, she has a strange AI modification that checks to see if the trainer is Lorelei and the Pokemon is Dugong. If both these conditions are true, then 2 out of 5 turns Lorelei will consider all her moves neutrally effective, which results in her only using Rest or Aurora Beam 2 out of 5 turns each. For Bellsprout, this is not really that relevant, but I had to say something while I set up Growth a whole bunch. After that, with full setup, I'm able to take the dugong out and move on to Cloister. And uh, yeah, it's also a one-hit. What did you expect? Slowrow's notorious for making things slow down because it's quite tanky. But still, Bellsprout gets the one-hit. Alright, this is feeling really good. There's only two more Pokemon left. Jinx hits, and uh, Ice Punch doesn't do much, so that's good. Oh, but it freezes. Alright, let's do this fight again. However, I expect things to be quite easy this time. I get back to Jinx, and it doesn't freeze me, so all that's left is Lapras. To ensure that it doesn't freeze me with Blizzard, I put it to sleep, and then knock it out with two Mega Drains. Now, what would you expect from this guy? Uh, hopefully not a lot. Just for some style points though, I brought Solar Beam along with me here. His Machamp is notorious for living through at least one attack, but in this case, the most powerful grass move in the game with same type attack bonus and max growth setup is too much for it. With him out of the way, Agatha's next, and if you look at Bellsprout's moveset, I think that it immediately becomes apparent that Agatha could possibly be the hardest trainer in the game for it to defeat. The reason is, all of her Pokemon resist grass type moves because they have the poison type. What I'm relying on here is sleep powder in combination with growth so that not very effective damage can still be enough. I did debate bringing a normal type move into this fight just for Golbat and Arbok because the grass type moves that I have don't have particularly big PP. What's really unfortunate about this fight is that I got paralyzed right at the start, which is essentially the worst case scenario. Mega Drain does allow me to gain back some health, 
but then Arbok comes out, lowers my defense with Screech, and knocks Bellsprout out with Wrap. While I set up against her in the second fight, let's talk about Solar Beam. Recently, I held a Parasect community race where many participants and myself tried to beat Pokemon Yellow in the fastest possible time with my rule set. One of the participants mentioned that Solar Beam actually takes fewer frames to use than Mega Drain, so that's one reason to use it here, especially when I'm at full health. But the other reason is because it does three times the amount of damage, which is significantly more against these poison types. Look at how much it does to the Arbok. That's a one hit. I made it all the way to the final Gengar now. I put it to sleep on the first try and then go for Solar Beam. And it does what looks like three quarters to it. That's pretty impressive. Agatha doesn't use a super potion and I knock it out on the next turn. So Bellsprout has made it all the way to Lance. Should I continue explaining these strategies? Probably not. I think you get it by now. Sleep Powder in combination with Growth is incredibly powerful. I will address why I felt comfortable skipping Rest earlier in the playthrough, and that's because of Mega Drain. It provides me the recovery that I need. Also, Solar Beam is the perfect move whenever you need a lot of damage to knock out an intimidating foe. In this case, Lance has three Dragon types, and they resist Grass-type moves. His Dragoner is when we see this type interaction for the first time. I want to take it out as fast as possible, so Solar Beam is going to be helpful here. It is key to note that he can't use Thunder Wave because of my typing, so this first Dragonair is not really that impactful. Usually I'm most worried about being paralyzed against it. When Solar Beam hits, it one-shots, so that's great. The next Dragonair does have Ice Beam, which could freeze. We did see that happen earlier against Lorelei. So I go for Sleep Powder just to be safe, and then knock it out with Solar Beam on the next turn. Aerodactyl's next. I thought that one Mega Drain would be enough, but unfortunately it isn't, and Lance heals the prehistoric Pokemon with a Hyper Potion. Instead, I put it to sleep and then knock it out with Solar Beam. Last is Dragonite, and Solar Beam's high damage will help KO it since it has a double resistance to Grass-type moves. Unfortunately, my third Solar Beam crits, Dragonite survives and uses Fire Blast, but all the growths pay off here, Bellsprout takes very little damage, and I defeat the Dragon Master. All that's left is the champion. His lead is Sand Slash, and Bellsprout's faster. So here we go. I put it to sleep and set up growth. Now, there are going to be some flashing lights in this champion fight because the animations are automatically turned on whenever you start facing him. It is possible for me to turn these off with Gamehook, and I considered that to make the content a little bit more watchable. However, that would make it so that the fight takes longer, and that would benefit Pokemon that are filmed now versus Pokemon that were filmed in the past when animations were on. So yeah, just uh, be careful here. Some flashing lights. Here we go. After setup, Mega Drain KOs the Sand Slash, Alakazam comes out, I put it to sleep, and surprisingly, Solar Beam takes it out in a single hit. Executor's next. I really don't want it to use Hypnosis against me, and it's going to because of his good AI, so I put it to sleep. I thought that this might be a slog, but I guess not. Solar Beam is very good. I remember that Magneton can't do anything to me that's scary, it can't use its electric type moves, so Solar Beam is just a quick and great solution for it. Cloyster goes down to a single Mega Drain, and all that's left is Flareon. I put it to sleep, just in case it crits with Flamethrower, Solar Beam takes it to red, and even though it wakes up, Mega Drain finishes it off. Bellsprout clocks in with a time of 1 hour 9 minutes and 28 seconds, with 10 resets at level 58 in exactly 4 hours of game time. Honestly, this is a really impressive performance for a first stage Pokemon. I haven't made a big deal about it, but Bellsprout is also a poison type. Right now, it is the best performing poison type that I have used to date. So what did I miss? Well, honestly, I don't think there are many things that need to be tested in this route. Many of Bellsprout's most painful points can be solved with straightforward and simple fixes. I'll mention these as I go through my second playthrough. Also, due to my mistake against Raticate in Pokemon Mansion, I found a stronger strategy against Koga, so that fight's easier now too. The biggest problem that I think really needs investigating is the rival Spiro on Nugget Bridge. I would also like to answer the question of whether Mimic is a better alternative to Solar Beam for Lance and the Champion. Yes, I had fun using this move for once, but it might not be the best play. Since the rival on Nugget Bridge is the biggest issue, I'll work backwards towards him. 
First, let's examine the end of the game. Solar Beam is obviously not ideal here because grass moves are resisted by flying types. Lance is, after all, a flying type master. By bringing Mimic into this fight, I can steal the second Dragonair's Ice Beam and use it to take out his final three Pokemon. This is the much better option. But now I'll have Mimic for the champion fight. Will this hurt Bellsprout's results? Well, with Sleep Powder I can safely Mimic Earthquake from the Sand Slash and then set up Growth. After that, there are only a few ways to lose. I could miss Sleep Powder on Executor and get put to sleep by its Hypnosis. It does have to knock me out after that. I could also Gen 1 miss against Alakazam or Cloyster, both of which have super effective moves against Bellsprout. And finally, I could get crit by Flareon's Flamethrower, allowing it to bypass my special boosts. Regardless, both of these fights feel so much better with Mimic, so I'm happy with this strategy going forward. Now, how can I solve the Spearow? A good place to start is at the next threshold for damage rounding. I faced Spearow at level 20 previously, so what about level 23? Well, that gives a guaranteed 5 shot with Wrap, which is pretty good. In a worst case scenario there, Spearow will go down in 3 successful wraps. The real nuisance though is that Spearow is outspeeding Bellsprout by 1. <laughs> like 1! I tried to level up to 24 with a rare candy to see if that would give Bellsprout the speed it needs to move first, but unfortunately I'm speed tied with Spearow then. Honestly, a speed tie is better than moving last every time, but maybe there's a better outcome here. I was skeptical about leveling up more than to 23 because like training 4 or 5 levels at this point is just like really going to waste a lot of time. So in the end, I was able to find a much better and more elegant solution. Let's start my next playthrough, because this will be the best way for me to show you how I massively improved Bellsprout's consistency in the early game, and this culminates in a consistent battle against the Spearow on Nugget Bridge. I left the earliest portions of the route the same. I fight the bug catcher that starts with the Metapod to give me the level required to get through the mandatory bug catcher. And then I make my first change. I defeat the junior trainer in Brock's gym for some additional experience. On Route 3, instead of fighting the Lass, I fight this bug catcher with 4 Pokemon. He gives roughly twice the amount of experience that she does. In Mount Moon, on my way to grab the rare candy, I fight this super nerd. He's actually one of the most experienced rich trainers in this entire area. With these additions, I'm now level 18 after the super nerd. And that's really good. That way Bellsprout has access to Sleep Powder going into the battle against Jesse Zekens. That makes the fight against the Rockets so much more consistent. In Misty's gym, I faced the optional swimmer at the start of the gym for some fast experience. I struggled last time against the Goldeen here because I was trying to rely on setup with Sleep Powder. I should just keep attacking, it's way more consistent. After making these changes, I defeat Misty, and now I'm level 22. Two levels higher than my last playthrough. But as you will remember, that's not high enough to outspeed the Spearow. But I still have two rare candies. If I use both, my speed ends up being one higher than Spearow. So why is this the case? Because last time I was level 24, my speed was one lower. Well, it's because the extra trainers that I fought provide just enough stat experience to get me over the threshold and make my speed round up one higher. So yeah, that's great. Now I can outspeed it and knock it out with Wrap, making this fight very consistent. Of course, there are going to be implications of using these rare candies here. Usually this means I'll have to do more training later on. I'll explain how I dealt with this when it becomes relevant. For the rocket outside of Cerulean City, I think the best approach is to use three growths, ensuring that I one hit the Machop, and then spam Wrap, and knock the Drowsy out. There is the potential to lose here, I don't think it's very high, last time I got quite unlucky. Surge is unchanged, and still easy. For Koga, I implement the strategy where I set up Swords Dance first, and then Growth, stacking badge boosts, and allowing me to one-shot all of his team members. Uh, yes, even the Venomoth. The thing is, this is extremely safe, because the first Venonat is only going to use Toxic or Psychic, so it has a 50-50% chance of doing anything because Toxic just fails. And after a few growths, I don't even have to worry about Sleep Powder missing, because Psychic won't do much anyways. Also, Venomoth will randomize between Leech Life, Toxic, and Psychic, so stacking 9 badge boosts increases my defense and minimizes its damage from Leech Life, which is 4 times effective, and Psychic is obviously minimized by the growths. So yeah, this fight feels great. Before Blaine, I still use 5 rare candies. I leave everything unchanged in this fight except my move ordering. Now I go for Swords Dance first, and then Growth. This way I don't reset the badge boost on my attack stat. That gives Bellsprout better damage ranges and allows me to knock out his entire team with ease. The Sylph Rival's easy. 
Sabrina is, of course, a gamble. I do have to, like, concede that. And then I make my first update related to the rare candies on Nugget Bridge. Before Giovanni, I don't use a rare candy. Instead, I just battle him immediately because that way I level up going into the Nido Queen, which doesn't matter because it's only going to use Tail Whip. And plus, I'm already going to outspeed the Rhydon at the end of the fight. So essentially, he's free once I take the Dugtrio and the Persian out. I don't rare candy before the rival, and this means that I level up going into the Kadabra, so it is going to outspeed, but with growth stacked up, I can tank an attack and knock it out. Previously I rare candied between every league member, I do this again, and then I have to go up against Agatha. If you don't know already, one of the quirks of her AI is that she really likes to switch Pokemon. There's a random chance of this happening, and it just so occurs that when I set up with Solar Beam against a Gengar that's asleep, she switches out for her Golbat, which then uses Wing Attack and knocks Bellsprout out in a single hit. Come on, are you serious? So that's my first reset in this playthrough. I do defeat her on my second attempt, and then I'm able to tank Lance out. Luckily Mimic really helps here and it speeds this fight up a lot. Now, right before Cloyster comes out, Bellsprout levels up, and this level, I mean this level, gives it 104 speed. Cloyster has 103 speed, so I outspeed by one and knock it out. Last is Flareon. Once it's asleep, two earthquakes get the job done, and that's it. Bellsprout clocks in with a time of 55 minutes and 23 seconds, with one reset at level 58 in 3 hours and 38 minutes of game time. This is a fantastic result. It's not often that a first stage Pokemon gets a sub hour time. It's actually only happened once before with Poliwag. Also, it's very rare for a poison type to perform this well. Actually, Bellsprout is currently the best performing poison type that I've ever used. I think comparing Bellsprout with Poliwag is pretty fair. They're both three stage lines that evolve with a stone, and each one of them gets a stat boosting move that increases their special. What I do find surprising is that Bellsprout achieved a better time when using growth when Poliwag had access to amnesia. Perhaps the inconsistency of Hypnosis held the tadpole back. Also, I think that the fact that Bellsprout starts with Growth and Vine Whip is a lot better than Poliwag starting with just Bobble. Follow me on Twitch if you're interested in seeing a couple other Poliwag playthroughs, because I am going to be doing those in the future just to see if I can get its time down a little bit. So today, Bellsprout earns its spot in the S tier ahead of the tadpole. Like, subscribe, ring the chime echo, and comment because I gotta read them all. Thanks to all my patrons for their support. If you've made it this far, you're incredible. Now, it's bloopers time. It's time to beat Pokemon Yellow with only a Bellsprout. The Pokemon with the nicest Pokedex number. Get... Bah! Come on! The opening line! Nah. Now, let's look at Bail... Now, let's look at Bail... Ba Bail... Bail Sprouts, yes. This time, Bellsprout doesn't damage itself, and it puts... Puts... Puts the fish to sleep, yeah. I think the best thing to do here is set up with growth now to maximize Vine Whip's damage. Damage. Damage? Because when Ghastly gets a hit, it could confuse, paralyze, or deal decent damage with Nightshade. Night, Nightshade, yes. Oh, come on. <laughs> this Ghastly is a higher level than the last two, so I want more growths than before. I start to attack with Vine Whip, which gives Ga- Ugh. Oh my gosh. It's hard. I gotta drink some water or something. My mouth's dry. Oh, water's so good. So good. In this fight, I need Acid to be able to do enough damage to one-hit the Venonats. That way, they won't hit me with super effective si uh, Effective, yes. Oh, burp too. Oh my gosh, can't record, not allowed. All right, I gotta get into this. Gotta get into this, like, reposition on my chair. All right. Feeling good. Okay, let's do this. Let's go now. Now, it's time to backtrack to Sylph to Feist. To Feist, yes. I always say that, Feist. It's like fight and face at the same time together. Feist. And in an absolute miracle, Slime connects again, and Amaz and Amazon falls in a single hit. Yes, <laughs> that's what I meant to say. And in an absolute miracle, Slam connects again, and a I said Amazon again. Oh my gosh. And in an absolute miracle, Slam can Slam, and I think Slam and then Alec Sam, and then, oh, that's hard actually. That means I can't get paralyzed, and that's the most, that means I can't get ter terribleized. Yes. Ah. <laughs> uh, this time conveniently, Spiro... Spiro. Sparrow. I always say Sparrow, because that's the bird, actually. <laughs> I was at the zoo with my girlfriend, and then back when we were, when she was my girlfriend, and uh, 
there were like sp sparrows around and I was like, hey, look at the sparrows. And she just like gave me this glare and I was like, oh no. <laughs> Oops. So I, I was just like, well, I think the best rule for this one is just go into the oak fight right after the league and see what it takes the Pokemon to have to defeat him. And if it's like impossible at the level that I'm at, then I'll go and level up. Or if it's impossible with my move set that I complete the league with, then I'll change my move set. This is a, this is, I think this is the worst oak that I've had. Okay, well, okay, I think I got it. As long as it doesn't wake up and I can heal a little bit. Well, I could wake up and crit with Ember again. Like, I'm gonna put it to sleep. I just don't want that to happen. Okay, please Charizard, just go to sleep. Please just go to sleep, thank you. Please go to sleep again. Okay, good. All right, stomp. I'm not going to heal this time. I'm just going to take the Charizard out. Okay, I got it. Um, I know I'm not going to two-hit the Gyarados, so let's put it to sleep. Then Mega Drain. I think I got him. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, Bellsprout defeats Oak, and that's it. Ah, oh, that was tough, but we did it.